This is the Retrospect Show. It's a monthly internet radio program about video games. I'm your host for the next 16 minutes or so. We'll aim for around there. Uh, my name is Sam Turner, and joining me this month is Peter the Pig at Willington. Hi. Chris the Crampon Derby. Hello. Tom the Tricam Percival. Hello. And Daniel Daisy Chain Frost. Hello. Uh, if you don't get what those references to, you will later on in the show when we reveal what some of us uh, were up to just a couple of weekends ago. Uh, so coming up on the programme uh, today, we have all the usual gubbins, really. Chris has got his gaming news, Glitch of the Month. Um, Thomas Percival will be presenting a very special themed uh, challenge, Dan. And if he makes it through that alive, uh, he'll be touching us all with some music. We've also got our free game of the month which is Marvel Puzzle Quest. Um, but first, um, because we're only a monthly show, we don't really have much opportunity to react to big news uh, that goes on, which is usually why Chris's Gaming News is more of a respective <laughs> look at uh, uh, what's happened. But I thought that we had to do in some way, we had to mark the passing, basically, of Satoru Iwata in some way shape or form because we've not been on the air for for the last 30 days um i'm not really sure what to say that hasn't already been said before about this guy and how important he was um to video games and indeed how important he was in terms of how a person should behave when they're fronting a company and how revolutionary revolutionary he was in both his approaches to design and presentation um, I don't know if anyone else wants to say anything but I just thought it was kind of important at the start to mark the passing of someone who was so incredibly important to the hobby that we all love mm, he's a true legend, was a true legend uh, what did he say he said on my business card it reads I'm a CEO but in my heart I am a gamer on my business card I'm a corporate president, in my mind I'm a game developer but in my heart I am a gamer amazing like, and that, that sums him up basically he was a guy who helped games get made he fu got games funded when might, they might not necessarily have been funded while he was uh, president of Nintendo he was the first uh, person outside of the family that actually made Nintendo the company in the 1900s uh, sorry in the 1800s uh, he was the first person outside of that family to run the company uh, he was massively trusted amongst all of the creative staff uh, yeah, like, and he was beloved by the fans. Like he's, yeah, he, he really was like a relatable CEO, and I think that that's something that we don't really have that often. His, I don't think his approach will ever be matched or eclipsed. I don't think that you will ever find a CEO with such honesty and mm. such a unique approach to uh, gaming. I think one of his last public appearances was at Nintendo Direct where he was apologising for people who may have been disappointed with their E3 uh, Nintendo Direct and just you, you know you just look at what other CEOs and heads of companies react um, uh, uh, taking for example you know Randy Pitchford ap refusing to apologise for the state that was Aliens Colonial Marines and then there's uh, here's a head of a, one of the biggest video game companies apologising if people were just mildly upset so yeah. get Metroid Prime. Yeah, uh, just, just brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. But he's, he, I mean, he was a titan. What we're saying is a, a titan has fallen. Essentially, I mean, it was actually one of my news topics for Chris's Gaming News, and I've, I've given it a sensitive headline as I can. Do. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's important that the two things that, for me, the two things that <laughs> pinpoint this guy's career. The first is the DS, yep. a, a, a portable games thing with a stylus but also isn't all about games. You can train your brain as well as play Mario. And yeah. second, the Wii. The yeah. one-handed controller. He, he basically made... He took, he took Nintendo back from... back to the NES era when the NES was, like, absolutely massive and every home had one. You know, that level of like, huge cultural significance. And he took it back to that with the Wii and with the Nintendo DS. He got 
people into games that weren't necessarily into games and he also got games out there that were very specifically for a demographic that weren't usually being catered to and he kind of widened the scope of what the conversation around games you know was which yeah really great um so amazing uh i really look forward to hearing what a sensitive type yeah. title topic we've got for this one exactly and, and just one final word on it i remember um a, a, an old episode of free play uh, which would be available somewhere on inretrospectpodcast.com where I think it might have been the episode where Sinan Kubber joined us and mm. y- you you were responsible for this, Peter Willington. You and Sinan banned the word fun um, oh. and said that video games could never be such. But I think um, what I- Iwata strived for, for that was that that's all video games should be. And... It's important to remember that sometimes. Mm. And as we all reflect on the life of such a great man, Chris will open up the various tabs on his browsers for stories that he thinks we will pick, one of which I think you'll have to choose another one now, um, as we head for Chris's Gaming News. Impartial reporting. Partially formed headlines. This is Chris's Gaming News. Flipping out. <laughs> That's not it, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> You'd hope not. <laughs> what a shame. <laughs> oh, my oh, my God. God. <laughs> oh, Chris. Oh, oh Chris. <laughs> See, I thought he was going to go for C-E-R-O, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, uh... Oh, Jesus Christ! <laughs> okay, Chris. Chris. There, there's a there's a heartfelt <laughs> opening out the window. Or it was going to be something like from Muppet to Morg. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh. Let's get physical. Physical. <laughs> Which way do I go now? <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> Chris. This is, I mean, two months ago, two months ago, like Sam opened with a, a joke about menstruation, but I think it's been topped. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I think if you were going to use his name in a pun, then I would probably say, yes, this is possibly as respectful as you could get. Admittedly, you could have just not used his name in a pun. <laughs> <laughs> that would but also... How would we have got it, Dan? How exactly. would we have got it? <laughs> exactly. Oh my uh, god. Um, so, this is Chris's Gaming News. We pick two headlines from the past 30 days of the gaming um, uh, information ejaculations and we talk about them. Um, right, I'm currently playing The Witcher 3, so I want the last headline. Please, Mr. Chris. Okay. Which way do I go now? What do you think this is about? Ooh. Um, I know that there have been... Oh, there was a recently released um, expansion that was released for free for Witcher 3, and it was... Part of the expansion upgrade was that they changed the way that Geralt moved, so he moved a bit better, and his movement animation was a bit smoother. Anything to do with that? You're right in the sense it's an expansion. This is the news that um, CD Projekt... And Red are bringing out two more expansions for The Witcher 3 so good. Um, in the next 12 months. The first of these is called Heart of Stone, um, which will be sometimes this autumn, and Blood and Wine, which will be early next year. But the reason I've chosen to talk about them is because when you usually have an expansion for a game, it's like, I mean, how long is an expansion usually in a game, would you say? An hour? Was, an hour? No, six two hours. Three. Six hours? Well, the first expansion, Heart of Stone, will be about 10 hours. Wow. And the second, the second one, Blood and Wine, will be 20 hours. And how much are these? Does it say price? D- haven't got a price yet. And to be honest, that date, I mean, with the scale of these things, that date will probably be pushed um, back even more. But um, I like I the fact it. that basically, you've basically essentially got another game in there. It's a, the equivalent <laughs> of putting The Witcher 2, the size of it, as an expansion to a game. And it, it, it starts yeah. to kind of question, you know, when is an expansion, you know, is there a cap on how long it or you how can, big an expansion can be for a game you, when it stops that and becomes a new game entirely. You compare 
what CD Projekt Red are doing in terms of the delivery of their updates and their expansions and how they treat a player once they buy the game compared to what Rocksteady and Warner Brothers do. Yeah. And the difference is just... Like, playing Witcher 3 is just a joy because you feel like CD Projekt Red are there there with you and they're just like, oh, we just really want you to enjoy the game. Whereas for what was... I mean, they... Rocksteady released the expansion, the Batgirl expansion. Apparently it's hour long, doesn't add anything to the story, and will cost you twelve dollars or something like that. Brilliant. Um or or you can get for some other cost just a skin for the Batmobile. And that's a game that is actually broken on the PC. Yep. So before they're even fixing those problems, they're releasing shoddy DLC and expansions. It's broken on the PlayStation 4, Sam. We were playing at your house, weren't oh, we? Yeah. And you got to a certain point in the game, and then it just kept on saying, please clear the area. You know, we tried to clear the area as best we could, and could just couldn't progress in the game. The game essentially was just broken. And I mean, did, you, did you see that email that apparently, because they obviously need, you needed a roster of people to upgrade it for PC, there was only 12 people doing that? Yeah. Oh, and they gave them months to do it. Yeah. Months. The, the conspiracy theory is, is that Warner Brothers knew of the issue and released it anyway, so they can always say that they released everything on the same platform at the same time, and now it's been pushed back six months, which is what it would usually be for a PC port anyway. Mm. So they've got the best of both worlds, really. Well, they definitely knew that something was up because they didn't send out PC code. So, But anyway, uh, that's a bad news story. Let's talk about the good things that CD Projekt Red are doing and the world that they created. And it's incredible that they're doing this all for free and, and they're constantly updating the game. So they're listening to players' feedback, like I said with the Geralt thing. Like He moves like a bag of cheese, but they've listened to that and they've worked on an upgrade and yeah. they've sharpened the inventory system. And these are things that you would only usually get like in a game of the year edition or you paid for it and mm. they're just releasing it all for free and the support that they're putting in is is it's incredible mm. Mm. so these are going to be pay these are going to be free expansions i have no idea in terms of cost or price it's not been uh, released just a rough schedule and the scale of it and also it's important to know that these expansions aren't going to be kind of like scaffolded on willy-nilly they actually they will have their own set of items gwent cards new storylines so it won't be a side quest in the traditional sense. It'll still be able to be folded into the main kind of fabric of the, the whole narrative. That's, that's absolutely fascinating. It is interesting, though, that we you kind of touched upon this idea of like they're, they're changing the limits of how we see expansion packs. I would say that, actually, previously, uh, Opposing Force, Blue Shift, uh, uh, and uh, that other third one... Um, were expansions for the original Half Life, and back in the day, Half Life, um, you know, Half Life getting an expansion was a big deal. And then reviewers at the time said that the expansions then were quite short, um, but they were 15 hours long. So expansions actually have historically always been quite large. Like, like whenever you ended up with a, an expansion for you know an RPG or whatever it is, you'd end up with an extra 30 or 40 hours or something like that because you paid 20 or 30 quid for it. But as as we moved into the, the 360 era and consoles started getting expansions and DLC and stuff like that, we started to see a shortening down of this expansion pack content. So now maybe we're starting to see this uh, expansion back out again into larger, uh, larger wedges of additional post-release content. So the Batman Arkham Knight season pass, which is six months of um, yeah. content, was $40? I'll do this in dollars because it's the only information that I've it's, got. I looked and on PSN, it's like 30 quid. So 30 quid for what has been so far not very good yeah. DLC. And, and they're highlighting that like you get racetracks and it's like... Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, the Witcher's paid DLC expansions, this is a report on Polygon, will be available as part of the game's expansion pass, which will retail for $24.99. Jeez. 15 quid, isn't it, really, roughly? Uh, Heart of Stone will be $10. Blood and Wine will be $20. Yeah, CD Projekt Red have uh, announced that they will release 16 pieces of free download downloadable content for The Witcher 3. It's just incredible. 
I think looking at, as you were saying, Sam, the, the, the way they listen to a kind of their audience. And I mean, I remember Pete, a number of years ago, uh, we interviewed uh, the guys at CD Projekt Red when they were doing Witcher 2. And I definitely got mm. a sense then of how much they how much they pay attention to their audience when they're because going from CG uh, go from the Witcher one into Witcher two they made so many changes to the kind of the core gameplay system based on kind of what the audience was wanting from the game and the feedback so they're very very open I think unlike a lot of companies to making these changes rather than just trust just keeping it all in house they do listen to their audience and they make these yeah. changes so that's following on it seems with with the kind of the dlc that they're doing yeah uh, just to just a finishing quote from the co-founder marcia Iwinski. if we ever decide to release paid content for wild hunt i like that fact that it starts with if we ever decide to release paid content as if <laughs> you know it's it was not always going to be free yeah yeah I promise you gamers will see why we decided to charge for it. We'll ask ourselves a simple question. Could anyone feel ripped off when they buy it? If there's even the slightest possibility they will, we won't do it. So... And long may just, that continue. It won't, but long, <laughs> long may some people continue doing it. Um, Dan, because you're brilliant, can you pick the next headline, please? Uh, I'm going to go with... Uh, the first one, flipping heck, because I don't really know what this flipping is. Flipping hell. Flipping hell, I don't know what this is about. Flipping hell, does anyone want to hazard a guess? Flipping hell. Is this hell. about asset flipping on Steam? No, it's not. Okay. Anything else? Um, again, uh, similar to what Pete did last month. <laughs> <laughs> have, I, have I picked the one that's got no content behind it? Is this about Uber again? <laughs> <laughs> that is an actual game. Um, this is a story of a streamer called Lobos. His username is Lobos Jr. Who's in his uh, copy of Dark Souls. He's added a mod to it to flip the screen, and he's currently playing the game upside down. Wow! Essentially, and this is the same person who gained popularity um, when he did the game blindfolded originally. But he's what? He's, That's impressive. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's flipped Dark Souls on the screen, and he's also that means he's flipped the controls essentially. So left is right, and right is left, down is up, that I'm, kind of thing. I'm, I'm scared to ask Chris a question about his gaming news topics because I'm just afraid he's going to say he doesn't know. But <laughs> when he did it blindfolded, was did do you think he knew exactly where everything was, or was someone directing him? I guess you could do it through sound, couldn't you? Because you know when. You, you, yeah, you generally you do it through sound. Because I've seen a lot of people do games blindfolded. I've seen people do Super Mario blindfolded, and it's really it's a mixture. Of, in in those old kind of NES games, arcade games, it's also the music. They're yeah. kind of learning a score, and they're playing yeah. a score. Um, Not to take um, away from the guy, but I must say, well, like, I've played Dark Souls and thinking, I'm going to complete this. I'm going to tell everyone I've finished Dark Souls. And it is one of those games that, because obviously you die so much and you're playing through it again and again and again, you constantly keep hitting the same rhythm, essentially. You know, like you're almost repeating yeah. yourself every time yeah. you do it. And I think that's kind of what he does. He, listen, he basically, as you say, Sam, he listens. I imagine he just gauges where, when he's coming a cropper based on what events he's triggering. He does it that way. Or he just plays it so much he learns it kind of like a script. Doing it upside down, though. Not God. happy about that. Not happy about that. No. Makes me annoyed. <laughs> it makes me annoyed. No, I agree. Why? Because I'm not, like... Because I'm no good at regular games playing regularly. Like... And this guy's like, oh, I've got the audacity to play Dark Souls upside down and back to front and blindfolded and... Do you think he does other stuff upside down? That job's too easy. I'm going to do it upside down. Could you... Is brushing your teeth the only thing that is the same upside down as it is normal ways? Plastering? No, because the plaster would fall a different direction if you did it upside down. Astronaut? This is an odd conversation to have. Astronaut's a good Astro answer. What, what's astronaut? What's an astronaut? It's a man who goes to space. <laughs> but what I mean is like oh I get what you mean because there is technically no up or no down so yeah. every action is the same don't matter where you drop it but some people some people like when they it happens quite a lot when they fall over over uh, off the edge of ships at night when it's and like deep and they fall into really deep water they don't know whether 
to go up or down. A lot of them swim down thinking they're swimming up because they're so disorientated. So, so, the, so the three actions that are the same, whether upside down or the right ways up, are brushing your teeth, being yeah. an astronaut, and drowning. Sounds yeah. Right. yeah, sounds about right. <laughs> Great. I'm glad we sorted that out. Put that to bed. Sorted. Always learning with the Retrospect Show. The This Is Xbox podcast is a fortnightly show focused on Xbox gaming. Join myself, Greg Giddens. Together we will take over the world, except for by together I mean you'll do all the work and I'll just sit on my throne. And my co-host, Neil Jarrett. It may sound perverse, dark and actually sick, but I can see exactly what you're saying about Greg. I can see right into your mind. As we talk Xbox games and Xbox news, interview guests and tease our fortnightly challenge video, amongst lively banter and awful, awful jokes. You can find the This Is Xbox podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and the This Is Xbox website. Hey, True Geeks. JJ Samus and Mike Wong here to talk about our podcast and website, True Geek Radio. If you're listening to this, you clearly have impeccable taste in podcasts, and we thought this might be a good way to say hello. We are True Geek Radio, a talented and passionate group of pals who love waxing poetic about all things geek. We're the mega fans, hobbyists, whimsical raconteurs, and chosen family, all of which drives True Geek Radio to exist. We're all about the conversation. That's why we'd like to cordially invite you to join us as we review the latest in video games, TV, movies, tech, and more. Look for our podcast on Stitcher, iTunes, or visit our website, truegeekradio.com. Interact with us live on our Twitch stream, Thursdays at 10 p.m. Eastern, or just stay informed with our weekly video wrap-up of the latest geeky news in The Update. Look for True Geek Radio on Facebook, Twitter, and of course, truegeekradio.com. Uh, coming up a bit later on, um, we'll be challenging Dan in two ways. Not only will we be putting his mind to the test, but we'll also be finding out how um, he was challenged physically uh, on a mountain. Um, but first, it's time for free play. This is Free Play, the part of the show where we play a game that won't cost you anything and try to give you a steer about whether it's worth your time. Uh, this month we are embracing the runaway steam train that is Marvel and one of their wonderful iOS and uh, Android and indeed PC creations, Marvel Puzzle Quest. Uh, Peter Willington, if you wouldn't mind taking on the reins of describing what the game is and what on earth you do with it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Marvel Puzzle Quest is a match three puzzler. Uh, match threes are things like Bejeweled, things like uh, Candy Crush Saga, things like, uh, well, they're, they're the two. What three three. things can you do upside down and the right ways up? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Match three. Match three. Um, but it adds on top of that layer of having to line up gems uh, into lines of three or more in a horizontal or vertical manner. Uh, it adds on to that extra powers, uh, which uh, you charge up after matching lots of gems of a specific colour, which are attached to characters from the Marvel Universe. You can tap on their uh, little portrait and then you get the ability to fire off a, a special ability like removing a bunch of tiles from play or an entire line using Hawkeye's little arrow stab thing. Um, <clears throat> and you are running up against opponents like goons and enemies from the Marvel Universe as well. So the each of the stages that are presented to you uh, in a story format are going up against uh, these bad guys that you have a certain amount of health and then matching a certain number of gems takes away a certain number of points from their health. Defeat all the enemies, you move on to the next stage. Uh, as the meta game, you have to collect comic book covers which give you access to new characters and also up access to upgrades to powers uh, which make it easier and uh, allow you to level up and do all that good stuff there's a, a, a sort of some very light rpg elements to it that in a nutshell is marvel puzzle quest mm, it is indeed um so the game is free it's on um mobile devices so there is an element of spend money get better uh in play here but do you think that any point that put you off dan 
Um, I have to say the the paid having to pay for it to make to kind of progress didn't bother me at all. That was largely because I didn't really enjoy the game. Uh, what did I hate, you enjoy about it? I just I yes, it's a match three, but I don't. Other than the fact that it had a Marvel logo slapped on the front of it, I got nothing out of it other than it being a, just a a run of the mill match three game if I wanted to play match three I'd play Bejeweled or I'd play Candy Crush I think those are superior games to it um, the whole thing of having the heroes and the villains it was cute but it didn't really add anything to the game for me um, why are they superior Dan? why are they superior? pardon? why are they superior? why is Bejeweled and that sort of thing why are they superior games? I think they're just better Constructed as as a match three, I I find them more challenging. I didn't find. What do you mean challenging? Break it down for me. I, I don't understand what the difference, what what the quality difference is. Well, the quality difference is how they play. I can only speak from my experiences of playing Puzzle Quest and playing the playing Bejeweled and Candy Crush and finding them more enjoyable to play. Yeah, but what what was more enjoyable to play about them? <laughs> the. Well, as you obviously, the the mechanics of a match three are all going to be very, very similar. Exactly. There's, so I don't, I don't quite know where you're getting. It. Surely, there's well, only kind of the way that they feel to play. I, there's no other way for you to really describe it. <laughs> but if well, they all play the same, how is one better than the other? But Candy Crush and uh, Candy Crush is my match three of choice, and I'm on Dan's side with this one. I'm I just wasn't a fan of it, and I think the the, the genuine difference is that I think Dan is struggling to come to words with there is that Candy Crush you get a set number of moves which means that there has to be an element of strategy involved meanwhile with this you just move in three things doesn't matter how many times you move all you have to do is reduce the enemy's health down to zero at the end of the day and you can very quickly just from playing one or two games no, oh, if I move this, I do that, I get Iron Man's special attack, that does 150 damage, I just need to do all the reds for five goes and I win. And it just, it, it was just dull at times, because there was no, I don't, I, I know Candy Crush is built on that sort of thing of making you addicted to it, you know, and building up that sort of, oh, no, I lost, I lost, I lost, yeah, I won at last, you know. But this was just, I, I agree with Dan completely, it's just a dull game, with a, it was just a dull match three with a uh, Marvel logo stuck on the front. I agree with everything Tom has just said. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's like he was in your mind and said exactly what you couldn't say. I, I, I think my lack of interest in this game has just prevented me from being able to vocalise any thoughts I have towards this game. It just complete... In my mind, it's complete non-entity. It's, uh, it's just advertising for Marvel, and I wasn't interested in that at all. Playing right. devil's advocate here. Okay. Yeah, play devil's advocate here. Because I don't want to be down on this game. Mm. But I'm not I'm not a fan of the match three genre, but what I did find quite interesting, even though I skipped through all of the story. Oh uh, really? Yeah. Really? Didn't oh. grip me, Sam. You missed you missed uh, Norman Osborne taking over uh Shield. Yeah. Dark rain. Spoilers. And um I what I was quite interested by its attempts to do was to kind of gamify the match three experience. So instead of having a gem with a countdown clock on it that will cause an explosion. They created some kind of narrative art that it was a kind of a bomb that was being planted there. Um, and I found that quite interesting, how uh, that they, they kind of, they gave it a, a narrative of sorts, how it, it, they try and made some kind of reach for that. It wasn't entirely successful, but I, have, I think it, I'd applaud them for that nonetheless. It's, very, mm. it's an interesting match-free game. If you want a match-free experience that's, a little bit different um, that isn't match four then <laughs> this would be a good one to go for there is um, there is a part of the game that I did like and indeed I think it was a touches that the Marvel Universe gave it so I like the fact that um, specific gems on the tile would be attributed to enemies that you were fighting and they would each turn they would count down to when that enemy would attack so there was an element of strategy in the terms of right I need to focus on this area to make sure I can get rid of that enemy before they get into a rounds of attack so I think that it did have some of the elements of uh, a more strategic uh, a, a more detailed match the puzzler in there and I also really enjoyed the the sense of Marvel heritage that ran through it. 
So I like the fact that you collected uh, number one covers for certain characters to unlock them. And I don't think that you would get that sort of sense of depth in terms of characters and who you're playing with in any other match three puzzler. See, Sam, what you said there, though, about... <clears throat> Oh, you know, there's a countdown on the thing. I've mm. got to think strategically about, de you know, diffusing that bomb. Yeah, but at the same time, in Candy Crush, for example, you've got 30 moves to win this game. In this, because I had an unlimited number, I just kept on making matches until eventually it came together, and it never felt... There was never any... I hate to say the word tension in a match three game, but I was never I was never pushed. I was just like, uh, eh, I'll be fine. Or even worse than that, I'd go, Oh well I know that Bomb Disposal Man does thirty five damage. I've got Storm, Iron Man and Spider Man out. Spider Man's got thirteen thousand health. Uh he can take it, I don't care. I'll just ignore that and mm. then keep getting these reds to get Iron Man's special ability. And it just it just it, it, it was just an issue with the game for me. I will agree, though, by the way, that the little cutscenes were worth watching. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Pete? Yeah, I, I think it's good. I think it's a good match really? three puzzle game. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's solid. Um, I don't think it's... I don't know. I, I don't think that it's as bland as you guys are making out. Like, those powers, for example, are very, very different. They're not usually used in match three puzzlers at all, and I should know I have played a billion of them. Um, and they, it's also a much fairer game than something like Candy Crush, which is, you know, mechanically constructed to make you lose at times. There are just times when you cannot win, um, and it, and the, before you start playing the game, it, the game is like, well, this person's either going to lose, like this person has literally no chance of winning. Um, so it's much fairer in that way, I would say. I quite like those little cutscenes with the Chang and the fact that it's bringing in the Marvel Universe. I also liked this idea of collecting the, the covers. For me, actually, I I found the uh, the constant like money grabbing and nickel and diming a little bit yeah. off-putting. Like, like, so for example, I spent all of my premium currency on covers and then couldn't figure out why on earth I wasn't having access to any of the new characters that I got access to. And then the game was like, oh yeah, check it out. Um, now you've unlocked the roster and you can move characters in and out. And I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. Uh, right, let me bring in this awesome um, uh, Wolverine uh, front cover that I brought in. It was like, oh, no, 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 you've got to pay some premium currency for that. And I was like, oh, well, I've run out. And then there's no way of getting any more. Yeah, I got a lot of the same covers as well. So I ended up with about, like, three Black Widows, two Storms, and a Hawkeye, two Hawkeyes. I was just like, what am I going to do with these? It's like football stickers. So you can use those covers to upgrade... Uh, your abilities like so uh, Iron Man's like super blast power you can upgrade with an extra cover and you can make it more powerful but yeah you're right like I mean uh, at a certain point it's like come on like uh. there, there is there is something that I did enjoy about the fact that uh, apart from the match three aspect of it you've also got this character development part so yeah. you are boosting your character stats your character's get injured and if you can't heal them you're almost forced to use another um, Marvel superhero, why they why they heal yeah. over a fixed time period, and and that's quite nice because you do feel like you're developing a strategy before you even enter the match three part of the puzzle. Like, who am I going to take into this fight? Who am I going to develop? And not to say it's that even that deep, but it's I think it's a part of the game that should be rewarded because it's it's not just taking the match three formula and just slapped two character uh, sort of avatars yeah. into the background and, and simulated a narrative around it. They've actually gone into some detail and depth into, right, how do we bring these characters into a simple puzzle-based universe? Mm. I think that they could have given more covers, so rather than collecting the number ones each time, maybe there's some more iconic covers that they could I, th I think put there in. are some I think there are actually some alternative covers that you okay. can get access to and the game is also constantly being updated so it just got yes. a, an update with the Ant-Man thing which is based on the new movie Ant-Man and Fantastic 4 uh, now yeah. appear on the splash screen of the main menu which is which is handy isn't it a little which bit of advertising is, yeah a nice little uh, advertising thing there. A, a yeah. question that I wanted to just give to Tom quite quickly was that um, as our resident comic book expert the Marvel Universe that they depicted here was a very very jokey Marvel Universe every 
superheroes got a quip every uh, villain is a very sort of hyper realised villain which is slightly a bit different to the film universe that we're used to more of a sort of 90s com- uh, 90s sort of Saturday morning animation version of the Marvel Universe is that something that you picked up on or felt or it, I've not actually looked at who actually wrote the game but looking at all the word balloons and everything like that it was totally had uh, Brian Michael Bendis's fingers all over it yeah it's that flippant sort of here's a joke here's a joke here's a joke right we're done get back to the match you know match the three match the three um yeah. I, I, I actually thought the dialogue was quite good I mean oh I, I wasn't pl- knocking it I was just saying it's a it's a different it's, because they're because they're using it as an advertising portal for the film universe it's quite they've taken well, quite a different approach to the writing well, of, of this since, since Disney bought Marvel, without going too much into it, everything is just in support of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You know, they got rid of the David Hasselhoff, Nick Fury, and brought in Samuel L. Jackson to the Shame. 616. See, I could bore the pants off you all on days for this, but it's... Um, it's still Challenge it, Dan, just wait it, for it. Oh, yeah, Challenge Dan, Marvel special. Uh, no, uh, it, doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't bother me in the slightest, because, you know, uh, at the end of the day, it's a product, and whatever keeps these characters going is great. Mm. Mm. really unique Pete I just wanted to ask you because I think of all of us you've enjoyed this game the most if this wasn't Marvel branded to the hilt if this was generic enemies mm-hmm. let's say generic as in kind of just enemies that have been made up for the game anything like that how much would that affect your enjoyment of the game do you think do you think the, the Marvel aspect has added on to it for you or is the game strong enough without that yeah I definitely think the Marvel element adds to it. Um, uh, I think adding this Marvel license onto it, or any license onto it that's particularly interesting, definitely does elevate a, a, a genre that's been experimented within multiple times. Uh, it elevates that genre up and that that game. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I don't play any old rubbish just because it's got a license on it. And I do think mechanically it is a more sophisticated match three than most people. Uh, will find in most other games. For me, it also depends on what platform you play it on. I played this on a PC, and I think that I actually would have enjoyed the game more if I had it on a mobile environment, which sounds like a very obvious point, but the fact is you can still get match-free games on a PC environment, which I find quite an odd thing. Um, I think perhaps if I play this on my mobile device, if I had a phone that was made in the 21st century, perhaps Mm -hmm. I'd uh, enjoy that. I am currently looking into that. But... um, I think there's something interesting here in terms of how it's narrativizing that game mechanic in a very interesting and quite dynamic and quite fluid way that's very robust. And I think people should check it out because of that. Well, just like everything that Marvel and Disney are doing in that universe, no doubt someone will pick up and copy their ideas. It's happening all the time. Stay tuned till the end of the show to find out what we will be playing next month for absolutely nothing. Um, If you missed that part, Um, because you get bored and turn off just go to retrospectpodcast.com but why would you get bored when we enter into the wonderful part of the program where we're challenging Dan not only mentally but we're also going to revisit a physical challenge that Dan put himself through not only seven around sort of seven or eight days ago when myself Daniel Frost Peter Willington and Chris Darby decided to climb Snowden and what a wonderful adventure the Mm. Snowden challenge was I've just uploaded our stats because I took a GPS watch uh, with me unfortunately uh, it failed um, on the way back down because the way back down for some reason was longer than the way back up Um, but I'm sure we'll speak about that but um, we did 7 kilometres in 2 hours and 47 minutes and 14 seconds uh, climbing up an elevation of 985 metres and we all burnt 447 calories and uh, that was our trip up Snowden, and what fun it was, gentlemen. I think my highlight of it was uh, Peter's attire. I mean, yes. he was very confident, very bold. He turned mm. up in jeans and a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles T-shirt. Which he's wearing tonight. You can't see yeah. that, but he's wearing no. the same shirt. I like to think it's not been washed. Yes, yeah, so do I. I my my, fa- my favourite part was actually just before... Uh, Pete's attire <laughs> when uh, prior to uh, climbing Mount Snowden um, Pete decided that you know what maybe maybe we could go a bit further maybe we could do something like I don't know 
Mount Kilimanjaro or K2. Um, he was laughed out of hand. I'm still well up for that. Still well up for that. <clears throat> well, even though halfway up the mountain he said, maybe we shouldn't climb that mountain. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Halfway, after about ten minutes, he was rethinking his plans. And I love yes. how it was—it it, was—it was touch or go. It was touch or go whether you were going to turn up in vans, let alone walking boots that you hadn't broken in yet. I lost the pace. I, I couldn't work out the pace to go. You know, to go all the way out there. I tell you what, though, was it worse than you were expecting? What were you? What were you expecting? I was just expecting. I was expecting a marathon, but what happened is we went in with a sprint, uh, and also it was a bit of an obstacle course as well. But that being said. I, the first third of it, I hated with every fibre of my being, and like, and I know I said this while I was on the mountainside, but I'll repeat it for our <laughs> listeners. There was a point where Dan and I stopped, and I turned to Dan and just said, "I can feel my heartbeat in my throat," and it was this real like thug 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 in my throat, and it was it was terrifying. It was really really scary, and it's because we just hammered it up that hill. As Chris would later say, you know, we made really good time up of it, you know, um, but. The second third and the, the final third and then, you know, the descent and then the three hours of additional walking that Chris made us do. Uh, <laughs> like, I actually did really enjoy that. Like, and, and because we were taking it more uh, at our own pace. And I think, Dan, you, you enjoyed it a little bit more as well after that, after we sort of figured out what our boundaries were. Absolutely. We, we, we definitely hit the mountain to begin with at a, at a pace that was too quick. Yeah. and we, it kind of caught us off guard so we then settled into our pace and I did, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the entire way up and then I enjoyed the way down until we got to the bottom of the hill and realised we had to walk another six and a half miles because Chris had taken us the wrong way yes. um, so that, yes. was, that bit was unfortunate to make it even more crushingly disappointed now I've uploaded the GPS tracker that I, the, the record that I took of our journey it's a lovely nice neat trail up the Watkin Path up to the top of Snowdon and it stops and I start it again after we had a break and I could actually see the exact moment where we went right and we were meant to go left mm. but what I love most about the three, the, the, uh, three hours of extra walk and we had to do um, at in the, the rain end, in the rain was the bit where we were travelling through the village and Dan's London brain kicked in and went should we should we call a taxi and we just Absolutely. like Absolutely Dan We've come this far. <laughs> People did not die in French fields for us to just because it's raining a little bit to call a taxi and make life a lot easier. Can you imagine if we got into a taxi at that point and some... We would have, I would never live that down. No, no. Some, like, haggard Welsh dude in the, from the mountains just going, like, oh, what have you been up to, boys? Like, uh, you know, we'd said, oh, we just went up a mountain and then came all the way back down. Oh, that's really amazing. You went up snow. Oh, you went up a really good trail. Oh, that's really great. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we just get a, can we get a taxi back to our car? Because <laughs> we're tired little wusses. Like, it wouldn't have bothered me in the slightest soft soft that um, also another interesting fact I lost two pounds and two percent of body fat which considering we all ate a large Domino's pizza each before we went to Snowden and then had fish and chips then had fish and chips afterwards oh they were good fish and chips they were. and jerky and jerky yeah. makes me think Beep. that Snowden is the best diet uh, a person could go on <laughs> Shouldn't you be challenging me or something? Let's, let's not, let's not yes, kid around we anymore. Yes, we have. We stopped speaking about the physical challenge. And today, may I present, curated by Mr. Thomas Percival, and indeed he'll be hosting this very special Marvel edition of Challenge Dan. Challenge Dan, Challenge Dan, Challenge Dan. Challenge Dan. Hello, Dan. I've been, I've been looking forward to this. I have made up one Marvel character, and I've got three from the annals of history that you won't be seeing on the screen anytime soon. So I'm going to begin Brilliant. now. Brilliant. So hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. The, the basic concept is that we challenge Dan every month from now on uh, until Christmas, and he's got, he's got to guess which out of four things is a false thing. Um, and I just want to say, I want to introduce a bit of jeopardy here before we begin. That, right, I've, I've, I've listened back to the previous shows, which you can do on retrospectpodcast.com. And moving aside the one, moving aside the inaugural Dan's challenge, where he had to win in order for us to play championship manager, Dan's had two challenges. He's won one and he's lost one. He's got four more between now and December. I propose that if Dan 
gets more right than he loses, he gets to host a Christmas quiz. If he loses more than he gets right, he loses that privilege for December. Yeah. Jeopardy. But what does he win? He gets to host a Christmas quiz, his favourite thing that he does all year. Which is Dan's baby. Dan is the ultimate quiz master and host. I I do think that the odds are stacked against me, though. Don't worry, Dan. Dan, I want you to host a Christmas quiz. Yeah, but you're you're asking someone who has no knowledge of Marvel comic books, so it's not easy. But I do, so I can help. Unless it's going to be Iron Man, Spider-Man, Hulk, and, I don't know, Bug Boy. Well, the the fact (laughs) that... (laughs) (laughs) Unless it's that, then I haven't got a chance. Dan, I think that there's got to be some jeopardy in this item, yeah, or it's just yeah. you're just not going to care. Yeah, we and, and we'll you help you, Dan. We'll help yeah, you. We'll we help. want you to win. You could have helped me last month, Pete, and you chose not to. No, I didn't. Yes, you what did. You gave me uh, just enough to not give me the right answers. Mm, Going to go back and check the tapes at some point, but because mm. the clue anyway. we gave Dan last month was the moon exists. Anyway, yeah, I think I think Dan accepts. So uh... Dan accepts. <laughs> so here we go. Dan's already won one and lost one, so he's tied. So here basically, we here we go. Let's see how. Can we I just tr- say you realise that if I don't do the quiz, one of you guys has to do it, and that's a yeah, lot of work. I know. That's why we want you to win, Dan. Well. At the exactly. end of the day, I win either way. I enjoy doing the quiz. So if I win, I get to do the quiz. I'm happy. If I don't win, I don't have to do the quiz, which saves me so a lot of time. So why are you I'm moaning? Happy. Why cry? Off you go, Percival. <laughs> okay, our first hero or villain, Aerosol, first appeared in The Defenders, 58, in 1976. Aerosol's real name, Robert Kilgrave, is a human mercenary. He uses a number of special gas-based grenades to fight heroes. In his first appearance, he was paid by the leader to take down the Hulk, but thanks to the Defenders, the Hulk managed to win. Wanting more power, more power, Aerosol submitted himself to genetic er- er- experimentation, giving himself the ability to change into a wide range of gases. That's amazing. Brilliant. That's Aerosol. amazing. I think he was in Flash, wasn't he? Flash! Ah. Tag first appeared in New New Mutants 7. Tag, real name Brian Cruz, was a member of both the X-Men and the Hellions. With the mutant (laughs) power, Tag Tag could tag people, causing them to admit a psionic (laughs) signal compelling others to run away from the tagged subject. He would often accompany the use of his powers by saying, You're it. (laughs) Okay. Almighty Dollar, created by Buzz Dixon for Marvel. J. Pennington Pennypacker was just an ordinary <laughs> certified public accountant <laughs> until he attended the camp run amok self esteem camp. The camp was actually a front for a crazed scientist who invented a device that gave anyone who used it superpowers. After the device was used on Pennypacker, it gave him the ability to literally throw money at his problem. <laughs> And finally, the Walrus first appeared in Defenders 131 and was created by J.M. De Mateus. He was a New York taxi driver whose uncle Humbert, a mad scientist slash janitor, used a devious experimental technology to endow Hubert with the attributes that would make him the greatest supervillain of all time. The Walrus is a foe of Spider-Man and claims to have the proportionate speed, strength and agility of a walrus. This is an inaccuracy on his part as a walrus is larger than a man, meaning someone with the proportionate abilities of a walrus would be slower and weaker than a normal human. (laughs) Brilliant. (laughs) Oh my god. Which one is false? That do you know all of these sound totally legit? Stan Lee yeah. did a lot of blow in the eighties. He did. So we have uh, Lynx Man, Tig, <laughs> Tag, please. He's American. Okay, so we have uh, Lynx Man. We have Tig. We have uh, uh, Daddy Warbucks and uh, mm-hmm. Walrus Man. Interesting fact, uh, Aeris, um, the Lynx Man is known as Axel in Europe. Uh, Sam, I'll start with you. <sighs> well, it's very difficult to say, but my first impressions are is that I think the walrus might be fake. Yeah. What's because, your reasoning behind that? Um... I can tell you why. Because I think I just marvelous, marvelous, stupid sometimes. But I think the walrus is just that's just too much effort to draw, isn't it? 
Yeah, I think. I think. What oh, is it? You don't know if you have to print it in colour. It's, it's all those wrinkles, Chris. But it's the fact that, like Spider Man, if you follow the totemic origins of Spider Man and fighting other totems who originate in animals, that's just not the animal that you would create. You'd go for a alpha predator or somewhere like that rather than a walrus. But Sam, his janitor uncle made him the walrus. But That's it. I think also in terms of... You've got to think with Spider-Man, when you're creating a villain, you've got to think of a villain that can chase Spider-Man. Spider-Man could get away from walrus far too easy because the walrus can't climb stairs or run up walls, I would assume. He's still a man, we should point out. He's just got the proportionate strength, speed and agility of a walrus. All right, okay. It's not that, he's not a walrus who's imbued with the properties, of, you know, the strength of a man. No, I'm assuming when we talk about agility, we're not thinking the agility of a walrus while sitting on a rock. We're thinking of the agility of a walrus in water. Well, I imagine that if the walrus ever got in water, he'd be pretty rapid, but I imagine on land, yeah, he's... he's exactly, so we're not chance. talking about the, the, the agility attributes of a resting walrus, because that would have no... That would just be a blob. Um, okay. Peace. What are your thoughts on uh, Daddy Warbucks, Money Man? The Money Man. The thing is, I think that one sounds just about legit enough to get through because basically Marvel did some like pretty obvious social commentary characters uh, during the 70s and 80s, like quite a lot of them. So that sounds like totally up their street. I'd, I'm, I'm digging the walrus theory i think mr percival knows a lot about how the marvel universe works and knows that spider-man had a lot of animal based foes chris what are your thoughts on this Do, does does the axe uh, lynx man sorry the the the, the lynx maestro mr aerosol man or what was the other one the other one was tag who oh yeah and tig tag um do that either of those amazing. sound like they could actually be super villains I really want Tag to be true, um, but my gut instinct when listening to them was the Money Man was the fake one. Um, See, I thought. But then again, Tom did say he's made it easier for this week, this month, Dan. He said he's made it easier for you. Mm. And the one that sticks out like a sore thumb in in that ensemble is the Walrus. Um, but I think that does stick out, and I think that's the problem. I think that I think he wants me to choose it. Can, can Percival quickly explain Money Man, his power is just throwing money at... No, uh, no, um, hang on, is it, what, what was his name again? His name was Almighty Dollar, and Almighty Dollar, according to ComicVine.com, the best resource for comic fans, lists his power as the spontaneous generation of money and also infinite wealth. So he can literally throw money at his problems by shooting money out of his fists. Amazing. Yeah, that sounds legit. Pick one, Dan. Do it. See, I was I was going to go with the Money Man because of all of them, that was the most puntastic description. And so that made me think that maybe Tom had come up with it and maybe just followed the comic book route of being all, all punished, which is why I went with that. But... Two out of three of you are, put, are saying the walrus. And the walrus obviously sticks out as being a, a bit weird. Uh... So I think I'm going to live to regret it because I think he's probably going to be Daddy Warbucks Money Man, but I'm going to say the fake supervillain is the walrus. Well, much like Sam, I'm going to go through the list now one by one and I'm going to break them down for you. The walrus is a genuine Spider-Man villain, Whoa. unfortunately. Uh, and the joke was that, yes, he had the proportionate speed of a walrus, so was so slow that Spider-Man spent the entire fight laughing and then beat him with a single finger. Almighty Dollar wow. was made for the NFL <laughs> and exists in the Marvel Universe as a man who can spontaneously generate currency from his hands. Jesus Christ. Tag... Who, no. did, who first appeared in New Mutant 7, real name, Brian Cruz, really was a member of the X-Men who could TIG people and make them run away from him. Oh he could also God. reverse his power and make them run back. Oh Unfortunately, my. Aerosol, 
never existed at all as a comic book character. However, I did steal his name from Purple Man, who's being played by David Tennant in the new Alias series on Netflix. But beyond that, no, Aerosol never existed, never fought the Hulk, Damn. just a complete fiction. That's amazing. So I've lost again. Again, you've given me a group of questions which I have no idea and no hope of knowing any answer to. Dan, if we gave you the question, what's the name of your wife? Like, as a question that you'd have the chance of answer, where's the challenge? Well, sure, surely I should have a chance at getting it right. Yeah, and there was a chance in getting that right. We all gave you our thoughts and opinions. And you all gave and... me the wrong answer. Yeah, but yeah. that's... I think it's as much challenge us as it is challenge you. Exactly. If I, if I challenge you, Dan, next month to a football quiz, would you be more comfortable with that? All right, yeah, okay. Pete, you do a football quiz. You do football challenge Dan theme for next <laughs> month, all right? Adult way. Yeah, cool. So, four, so that'd be like something like four football teams from around the world. Dan's got to find out the fault. Something like that. Yep, something up for like that. that. I'll or do that. four names of managers. Just I'll come so up with something research brilliant. It. Find, find a topic and pick it. Also, Dan, I should point out to you that in Challenge Dan so far, at least twice people have given you the genuine answer and you've gone, no, no, hey, I know hey, better. I did that once. It's true. The second time I agreed with you. Um, so as we enter into the bowels of the programme, we've got Dan will be hopefully recovering faster from this mental challenge than he did his physical challenge climbing up Snowden and bringing us uh, a musical vignette uh, to finish the programme. But first, Chris, you got your glitch of the month. This is Chris's glitch, 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 glitch of the month. Okay, it's been a very slow month for glitches, but I have found this quite bizarre glitch um, from the eagerly anticipated Street Fighter V. Mm. On E3's live stream, um, and particularly the character of Chun-Li, in particular, Chun-Li's chest. Um, I'm going to, for my colleagues here, for the benefit of my colleagues here, just um, copy and paste in um, a particular piece of contextualization for what this glitch entails. We, we, will, we will put this image on the website as well. Yeah, which baffled fans, really, uh, as to um, how the game makers were unable to kind of do the physics of this justice or accurately. Yeah, that's, that's my word. Gentlemen, do you want to describe what, what you, can you describe what you're seeing? Well, if for anyone who knows how video games work and they know how women are unfortunately often portrayed in video games, certain attributes are perhaps shown larger uh, than would usually be the case. And in this particular image, and it's like a it's a it's a gift, so it's an animation. Um, certain attributes of Chun Li seem to move independently of the rest of her body. I would say I think that is a fair description. Jesus. Yes, I think uh, my favourite comment on it was uh, a Twitter user called at Abelina, who said, "Capcom, please fix Chun Li's boobs. They are not helicopters." <laughs> Which makes it worse, considering the image that's the kind of on the website as you'll see. Um, she's she's fighting. I believe that to be Cami, who doesn't have this problem. Apparently, it's only if you're on that particular side of the screen, on the player select screen, that that problem occurs. And they've commented, the game makers Capcom have commented saying, the whole Chun-Li jiggle thing is a glitch that only happens on the second player side of the E3 build and it will be fixed. Do we know whether it happens when you like, choose a male player and you just get his pecs going round and round and round? Yeah, that's, that's likely. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. an utterly bizarre glitch. That is, that well is... done, internet. Yes, indeed. Riddleless without Sam. Well, Sam's not here now, so time. For... We've, we've, we appear to have lost him. Uh, a, no. couple of, a couple of months ago, we lost Chris, and this time we've lost Sam. One of these yeah. days we'll all get through. So basically, 
basically, I think what's happened is Sam's virtually tagged me in, so I will take over the rest of the hosting duties. Um, we're going to uh, go on to Dan's awesome soundtrack thing, which he'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, but touch before I do that, yeah, a Touch of Frost, which we haven't nicked from... Uh, was it ITV or BBC that put that out? ITV, David ITV, Jason. Uh, with Jason, yeah. Uh, the, David uh, Jason. Yeah. I just call him Jason. We're on first name terms. Uh, last name, Pete. Last name terms. Uh, this is going well already. <laughs> so uh, I miss Sam. Before we say goodbye, yeah, I mean, we all miss him. Before we say goodbye, uh, I want to tell you that the next game uh, that we'll be playing uh, on in retrospect show will be Free Rice which is available on freerice.com. You can find a link to that on the front page of inretrospectpodcast.com. As soon as you hear these words being said, you can hear them. They'll be on there. We've got a link on our front page. It's always on the right-hand side. Go there. Have a look. We'll have uh, all sorts of awful GIFs and videos uh, on uh, the Glitch of the Month. We'll have uh, links to all the interesting things that we talked about in the podcast in the uh, podcast page and you can help support us we're on uh, well we've got some merchandise and all sorts of other rubbish stuff but there's also social media that you can follow like uh, subscribe and do all that good stuff but the most important thing that you can do is subscribe and give us a rating and a review on iTunes because that really does help us out uh, pushes us further up the charts and it means that other people get to hear this so if you like this and you want other people to hear it apart from just going out and telling all of your friends and shouting at uh, people in the middle of the road like a madman uh, then uh, giving us a rating and a review is a brilliant way of doing that so yes uh, come to inretrospectpodcast.com and we'll hook you up with all of that good stuff now for a touch of frost where did he touch you? this is a touch of frost Dan Hi. Uh, this month, uh, for A Touch of Frost, we have a piece. Uh, the remixer is someone called Joshua Morse. And you can find this track uh, on gamechops.com forward slash arcade attack. Arcade attack being the album that you would find it on. And this is called Chronosphere. And it's the Chrono Trigger World Revolution remix. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 